Hello, ho, 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 and Merry Christmas to everybody. This is the Christmas edition of the THC Show. THC for truth, hope, and change, and about THC, that uh, amazing compound found uh, within the cannabis plant and made by our own bodies in the force of anandamide. Uh, it's Christmas time. I hope you're all uh, in the spirit. Uh, there's an opportunity every time uh, this comes around for people to have a good time. I believe that people should have as much fun as they can. That's, to me, the real purpose in life. Uh, you only get one shot, and, and while you're here, you should probably have as much fun as you can because that's what feels the best as far as I'm concerned anyway. And Christmas is this wonderful time of year when people get into the spirit of giving things and of, of looking for the, the joy in things and helping out people and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of beautiful, beautiful stories that happen every year around Christmas time. Uh, I had uh, my Sufi friend, Mr. Habib tell me that uh, really the, the birth of Christ uh, happened in the middle of the summertime and not the wintertime. We've got it all wrong. And I said, well, to me, it doesn't really matter uh, about when the actual birth was. Uh, perhaps if we were to have our Christmas celebrations in the summertime, it'd be a little harder to pull families together. Uh, there isn't quite the same needs as there is in the middle of winter. So whether or not uh, the symbol of what it's all about, the, the birth of uh, Christ happened uh, on uh, December 25th or not, uh, I don't know, I don't care, it doesn't matter. This is a great time of year to, to love each other, to stop and think about the blessings that we have in life, to try to find some joy and to create some joy for some other people. Uh, at the Cannabis Substitution Program, uh, Healing Wave RV, this is the second year in a row that we're going to have our Tubes and Dubes event, and that's going on right now outside, and uh, we'll check in with that uh, in, a, in a few minutes. We're going to do our 420 session in here, and then we'll go out and see what's going on with the Tubes and Dubes. On the show today, we'll have 8 out of 10 Glenn, as always, join us for the 420 session, and we will do our regular uh, review and update of the Cannabis Substitution Program going on here and other places across Canada. Um, the, the, the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit today is that there's good news uh, happening in that the Canadian government continues to exempt more people to be able to use psilocybin. Uh, in this case, it's not for people that are at end of life. It's for people that are suffering from anxiety and depression. So that's a wonderful step. Uh, really, we need to have that uh, in our world where these uh, psychedelics, especially psilocybin, cannabis, and other, other substances are easily and readily available to people so that they can use them for their own benefit. It's long overdue that the lies and the hysteria got apologized for and that we turned this situation around. Uh, speaking of apologies, you know, there's been this overdose crisis going on for the last uh, six years here. Uh, and, and that's what we're doing with the Cannabis Substitution Program is trying to address that. It's been uh, several years of uh, public health emergency, overdose deaths, uh, huge amounts of people have died through all demographics. And uh, it's all born out of the overprescription of opioids and the misuse of opioids. Uh, this happened for money. As, as everything always has. Uh, the, uh, the pharmaceutical company Purdue, uh, upon finding out that uh, the government was going to clamp down on uh, doctors over-prescribing opioids because of the problems that people were having with opioids, uh, was in trouble. They thought that they were going to lose about 70% of their market share as a result. And so uh, they came up with a plan to come up with a, a special type of opioid. It wasn't special at all, really. What it had was a, a coating on it that, that made it time release so over 12 hours. They managed to convince one clerk in the FDA to give it a special ranking and, and a special category of non-addictive opioid. And they sold that like crazy to the doctors. They knew early on that the people were bypassing that coating. It was easy enough to do. You just put the pill in your mouth for about 30 seconds, rub off the coating, and then you could crush it up and snort it or take it at that point. And it was a full-on powerful dose of that particular opioid. And so they knew early on that it was becoming a real problem and that people were dying. But of course, it was all about money for them. And, uh, and they continued on uh, on their plans to sell a billion dollars worth of Oxycontin. And they did. And they did it ahead of schedule. And they did it by lying and manipulating and cheating uh, and hiding what they were doing and all of that kind of stuff. And so now it's, it's come to light because, of course, you know, 
it, t- it took about three years before uh, investigators really started to get serious about what was going on here because I, the, the different places in the states that Purdue launched their product, um, within a, a couple of years, the, uh, the prisons were full, the crime rate was through the roof, uh, the, the drug trade had included OxyContin, and many people were dying. And so the investigations, although it was difficult to investigate, it seems Purdue has a lot of uh, paid friends in high places, but uh, it's gone on for quite a while. There's the movie Dope Sick is being showed on Disney+. Plus. Uh, it's a good expose of that. Uh, Purdue was successfully uh, prosecuted and convicted. They have been sued. Um, and uh, all of those are part of the public record. Uh, we have all sorts of emails and communications uh, internally from Purdue. Uh, all these different court cases, all the different things that came out. So it's a very accurate depiction of uh, the whole uh, scam that's happened with the Purdue Pharma. Uh, basically killing millions of people to make billions of dollars. Uh, It's a really sad tale. And the reason I'm mentioning it at this point in the show today is because there's been a development in that. Uh, Recently, there was a bankruptcy judge that uh, agreed to a deal that uh, the pharmaceutical company put forward that uh, they would pay billions of dollars in in reparations and fines. But uh, if upon doing that, there would be no ability for the government to prosecute the upper-level executives and owners of uh, Purdue Pharma. And that was the deal they managed to get. This is a very sleazy company with a lot of leverage and, and a lot of ways to get what they want, and they've been proving that all along. And so they got that real sweetheart deal. Billions of dollars paid out in fines and penalties does nothing to harm the actual owners of Purdue. They are still millionaires beyond belief. They live in a complete bubble of ivory towers and private jets and all the rest of it, and they weren't going to be affected at all by having to have their company pay out billions of dollars. And and that's just completely not right at all because these people are criminals. They are slime bag flipping murderers. They knew what they were doing, and upon knowing it, they did everything they could to continue to boost their sales and ignore it and try to get away with it. So they need to be prosecuted. They need to go to jail for a long time. And so now a superior court judge has ruled that that bankruptcy judge did not have the, the right to do that. He's thrown that agreement out. And, you know, those slime bags at Purdue... Uh, Their CEO came out upon that decision and was lamenting the fact that, oh my goodness, you know, it's really too bad that that happened because here we were poised to, to give these billions of dollars to help with the overdose crisis. Can you imagine? Now they're not going to give the billions until they're forced to, obviously, and if they're not forced to, they're not going to. And this overdose crisis that they created is still raging on, and here's this this piece of crap slime bag of a CEO out there saying that, oh, well, now we're not going to be able to you know, have that money available to people to use to address the overdose crisis because of this poor decision. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. They are slime bags through and through, and they just can't help but look like it every time they open their mouths. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, I really hope they get jail time and, and more. Uh, this is a horrible, horrible thing that they have uh, perpetrated on the world uh, under the guise of helping people with pain. And opioids help with pain. That's what they're for. They, they work really well at that when used properly. They're not for long-term chronic pain because you can't keep on using opioids without having to increase the dose constantly because of the way they act in the human body. And opioids have the ability to shut your heart down and shut your respiratory system down when you take too much. So, you know, it is a real concern, the amount of opioids that are out there. But, you know, people in many cases want their opioids, and when used properly, it's a fine thing, and they should be able to have that. But we need to have the truth told about it. We need to have proper regulations on things, proper education about things. And what's been going on without all of that is the pharmaceutical companies have been free to just promote their drugs and, and pay no consequences for the, the harsh consequences. I mean, we've got <laughs> criminal law being used against uh, opioids and, and other street drugs and, and drugs that are you know, typically uh, manufactured outside of the legal framework and, and in many cases from uh, other countries uh, offshore. And so you know, this, this is what the DEA spends their time uh, going after is, is these illegal drug operations. Meanwhile, the legal drug operations, the pharmaceutical companies, 
they get to have their way. They're not even being really scrutinized at all. And as it turns out, the FDA is, is if not in on it, they're certainly complicit. They're certainly not willing to shake shake things up or, or rock the boat with respect to Purdue. It, maybe they're afraid that Purdue's got no ethics and a whole bunch of leverage and they're going to be, you know, taken to task for anything they ever do against them. Uh, or even maybe more likely they just think that there's a job waiting for them down the road where they're going to, like that clerk that I mentioned before that gave that uh, special category for OxyContin. Well, it wasn't long and he wasn't working for, for the FDA anymore. He was working for Purdue at about $395,000 a year salary and his job basically was to advise Purdue about how to get to the FDA, how to get them to do what they wanted to do with getting the, the regulations and the wording in the regulations and everything that would suit their ability to make a whole bunch of money and not ever be taken to task for the people that are suffering as a result of it. So it's quite the story. It's ongoing. We'll see what happens from here. But this is the situation that's been going on um, with us for all of this time. We're coming up to five years now in February that the Cannabis Substitution Program has been operating here in Vancouver. Uh, it was an effort to try to make it as easy as possible to get high-dose cannabis edibles to the people that were struggling with addiction to these hard drugs and the opioids. Um, cannabis high-dose edibles, in the form of edibles, cannabis can really help people get, get through withdrawal and replace the use of those substances. Uh, the smoke tip flowers of cannabis really doesn't have the potency to be able to address the issues that people are having that are using these hard drugs. Primarily the main drivers of, uh, of that type of addiction to those drugs is trauma. It's personal trauma that's happened to people throughout their lifetime in many cases as children and they've just been trying to deal with life ever since and this is a way that they've uh, come to find that they can deal with life. Uh, they, they end up spiraling down financially in many cases, they end up on the streets, they end up trying to source their opioids from friends and family and then from you know, street dealers, and, and, and that's how it all happens down here. This is the cycle that's been going on. And so for the last several years, we've had thousands of people die, uh, so many people overdose. Oh my goodness, I don't think we have any numbers on how many people have actually overdosed and not died. It is ongoing in this neighborhood all the time. We hear the sirens all day long, we see the paramedics dealing with people in the lanes and on the sidewalks, they save most of the people. There's the supervised injection sites that have, have come up to, to deal with this as a harm reduction measure. And thankfully, there's been no deaths at the supervised injection site. The original one that was set up over here, I, I, I don't know about all of the other ones, but their track record is really, really good. When people are supervised when they're taking opioids, even ones that are tainted with fentanyl and, and deadly and, and, and they overdose, if they're supervised, they don't die. They have ways, Narcan kits and other ways of bringing people back and so many times that has happened. So there has been so many tens of thousands of overdoses that have happened in the last several years here. And because of my experience with high-dose cannabis edibles in this neighborhood about 18 years ago with the Herb School, Vancouver School of Drug War History and Organic Cultivation, uh, learned that the high-dose edibles is what it takes to get people through withdrawal. That's the big barrier to getting off of those drugs. And so when the recent crisis hit uh, back in 2015 here, for me, I knew right away that the, one of the reasons, or one of the ways we could address this overdose crisis was to have easy availability of high-dose cannabis edibles. And instead, at the same time, the government of Vancouver, in an effort to try to regulate the dispensaries that had popped up, somewhere between 150 and 180 of them were operating without licenses, uh, they decided they would give the ones that would qualify licenses uh, if they removed several of their revenue streams and if they weren't too close to others and too close to schools and a whole bunch of other restrictions in an effort to really wipe most of them out. But the, one of the main things that got me at the time was they were taking away the ability to sell high-dose edibles. And with an overdose crisis uh, upon us at that time, that's something that really needed to happen was these dispensaries needed to be a place where people could go and get high-dose edibles. So, being frustrated with all of that, we started our project. I went to uh, VANDU, the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users here in Vancouver that advocates on the behalf of oppressed people due to bad drug laws, and got unanimous approval by their board to go to city council and ask for support there for a program that would give away high-dose cannabis edibles uh, in, in an effort to make it as easy as possible for people to get them. Uh, that all happened, except Vancouver City Council would not give me their support. Uh, they did, two and a half years later, uh, pass a motion saying that they would support low barrier access to cannabis for the opioid crisis, and that was based on the work that we were doing. 
But we did our program without their support. We started it in February uh, five years ago, coming right up, and we've been operating it ever since. Um, we've we've had uh, almost zero interference as well as almost zero support. And and I, I guess I shouldn't say that because the City Council of Vancouver did pass that motion unanimously, although they have not been willing to give us a license that would allow us to operate from the storefront that we started from. Uh, when they passed that motion, we met with the city. Uh, we... we had an understanding that we would find a place to provide our program indoors, and we did. Uh, but after a couple of weeks of operating, we had the licensing department come by, and uh, they said that we needed to have a license to do what we were doing. They threatened our landlord. And so uh, we've been going through the process ever since, and it's now been a year and a half plus since we opened our storefront. Uh, when we were eventually evicted due to not having a license and, and the fear of our landlord that he would be prosecuted by the city for allowing us to be selling cannabis and providing cannabis without a license, uh, we moved into an RV and we've been providing from an RV ever since. Uh, there was the, the thing that happened two weeks after we got into the RV where the Vancouver Police Anti-Vending Squad came along and seized all of our products. They did not charge anybody. I made a big stink about all of that. And uh, they have not been bothering us ever since. That's well over a year ago that that happened. And it, it occurs to me that probably the reason that we haven't had any interference is because according to Section 262 of the Canadian Criminal Code, it's an indictable offence pe with a penalty of up to 10 years in prison to anyone who would prevent or attempt to prevent or impede anyone trying to save a life. And that is exactly what we are doing here. We are saving people's lives. We have a program of over 260 people. We provide them with 420 milligrams of high-dose cannabis edibles every four days. That's over 100 milligrams a day. And, and that has allowed them to get through the withdrawal and get off of the street drugs. And the vast majority of our members report that they're no longer using any of the other drugs that they were using before our program. They're simply using cannabis. And that that has saved their life and given them back a quality of life that... Uh, that, that results in, in dozens and dozens of many, many people, so many people that I've, I've met and know over these years of having done this, that, that their common mantra is, cannabis saved my life. So here we are, absolutely saving people's lives. We have uh, letters of support from doctors, from professors, Professor Zachary Walsh, the, the leading expert in cannabis as a replacement for opioids, Dr. M.J. Malloy, also one of the leading experts, those gentlemen have, have given us letters where they state that if we were to cease our operations, that we would put many people at risk of death. We are saving people's lives here. And as far as us being impeded, it is a serious impediment that we are struggling to get the federal government of Canada to support the efforts that we've been doing here over the last five years where we have been demonstrating time after time after time that this is effective, this helps people, this saves people's lives, this needs to be available across Canada and all the other communities that are suffering with this overdose crisis. The lack of a license from the federal government is seriously impeding our ability to meet the needs of this neighborhood. We don't turn anybody away. We're doing a fabulous job here, but we're not finding everybody. We're not getting to everybody. We are being impeded by a federal government that will not give us a license for over 15 months since we applied now. And... Obviously, the reason is financial, that they've made promises to big, powerful people that they won't allow cannabis to be provided at low cost and no cost with the system they've got going. That's the 419 warning. So roll them if you haven't already and get them ready or whatever. And in a minute from now, we'll, we'll get into that. So this is what needs to happen is uh, the government needs to be charged with what they're doing in impeding our efforts to save the lives of people. I think we have done everything plus more to prove our case and to be able to show that what we're doing saves people's lives and what the government, their inaction, is as deadly as action against us would be. That their inaction in giving us the license that we, we need is preventing the city of Vancouver from allowing us to operate out of a storefront. It's preventing the other places across Canada that are operating our program to be able to do that. They need to get out of the way. If they're not going to support us, they need to at least get out of the way, and we need to get a license or, or the ability to be operating from a storefront, and all of the other cannabis substitution programs need to also be able to operate from storefronts and to operate in all the different places in Canada where they are required. Anyway, uh, it's 420, which means Santa Glenn is here. Oh, 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 oh holy oh, 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 smokes, you grew a beard. Happy 420. I thought it was you. 
Uh, you know, yeah. you you hide all year long, but but you can't hide that voice. No, you can't hide that voice. You know, I like, figured that out was probably you coming down the chimneys and stuff. You know. Yeah, it's kind of hard with a chimney here. They're a little old. Like well, we would locked them in in the nineteen hundreds. <laughs> you know, it's that Santa magic that makes it all work somehow. Somehow. So how's it going? It's going all right. We got tubes and dubs going on yeah, outside, as you know, because you yeah, organized well, yeah. everything. I'm all wet out there. Yeah. And thank you to Cabela's. Thank you to everybody that yeah. has helped with this. Everybody that's donated to this uh, wonderful thing that we're doing now for list, the second year in a row. I have a list of people. Can you I want to read it off? Yeah, I'll read it off while you're lighting that joint up. Mm -hmm. All right, so the only uh, thing that shuts me up. <laughs> what the joint? Or reading up the list? Sucking on a joint. <laughs> all right, so we want to uh, definitely thank um, Doug and Michelle Sakura, Dana Larson, Cindy. Hammerick? Hammerick? Hammerick, all right. The Coca Cafe, Charlie Cheech, Jimmy Scoden, William and Isaac Hicks, uh, Brian B. B Lert, I think that it is, Guy Grolemon, Christina Smith, Neil Magnuson, Tim Hortons Mission BC, Cabela's Abbotsford, Hi Guys, Krista C.W. Parker Randall, and Weedy Richards. And and John Murray. And John Murray, yes. And John Murray. Oh, yeah, we got to put John in here. Yeah. Yeah, because this will go up later on my page. <laughs> and all of our wonderful volunteers and the people that are helping out today. <coughs> and to Sterling, Professor Sterling. Yeah, Sterling, yes. Who got this all going, and it's a great idea. Uh, they recently had theirs. I think they gave out over 300 pairs of socks yeah. in Saskatoon there. I was just making a comparison out there. It's rainy and cold, and we haven't got anybody. But when they were in Saskatchewan, and it's cold and wet and rainy, they had 300 people. Are, are we yeah. are we a little bit worried about the cold rain out here? Well, not not realistically. Yes, I not, know. Not you, comparatively, you, you, you would think so, eh? Yeah, comparatively, we got it really easy here. Yeah. In fact, you can look at it to if you're watching the news at night. Yeah. Uh, this the weather on the news at night. <laughs> you can see that uh, you know as the snow starts to to creep across North America. Yeah. It's pretty much right here in Vancouver, <laughs> where is the last place to go. Yeah. So the, yeah. The whole map of North America is all whited out. And there's this little place right here in Vancouver, Vancouver Island, where there's not much going on there. Well, we are, and then it does. And we then are going to have a white Christmas. It looks They're like saying it. we got three days of snow coming up. Wow. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. A real white Christmas. Yeah, that's what they're saying. Oh, well, good. mission anyways. Maybe not Vancouver, but where I am, uh, yes. Yeah. So yeah. There we go again. You there's see? That, that, there that's, you go. That's what you, happens when you want to live an hour Vancouver, away from Vancouver. <laughs> and, and I went for a drive out to mission <laughs> just the other day. I got, got to... Uh, a great donation out there from the BC Bud guys, yep. uh, and you know oh, they, they've been Darren, I love them. Yeah, uh, I love Darren and, and everything, and Merry Christmas to you guys as yep. well. So I went out there for that, and I didn't get very far out of downtown here when now there's snow around me. <laughs> and the farther east I went, now there's snow <laughs> yeah, everywhere. Yeah. And pretty soon you know, I was in a winter wonderland. You didn't even wonderland. stop by my house. I have no time for these things. <laughs> my no life is too quick you. to be hanging around visiting people. <laughs> I shouldn't even leave here. No way. Eh? You know. No. You know, maybe but you, I, you could ask me to pick it up because he's just like ten minutes away from where I live. Well, it, that's true, and, right? and then could, we would have had it there today anyway. You would've, yeah, you would have reached out but, to me uh, and said, "Hey, go see Darren." I don't mind going to see Darren. No, I know. It's uh, nice know I wanted to, to visit with him a little longer than I actually managed to, but I ended up having to go meet John as well. He had a big uh, donation for us again of his muffins. Oh yes, thank you very much, and John. Also uh, got some good flour for us. Thanks, John, for that. It's really good to have good flour here. My goal has always been a buck a gram. Yep. Um, even though that's still way too expensive, that's four hundred and eighty-four dollars per pound of a of a plant that grows like any other fruit or vegetable. No, that's not that's, true if you're growing indoors. Yeah, uh, that's only true if you're growing outdoors. So the good cannabis is worth more for sure. And and I wanted to have some of that good cannabis at a dollar a gram. I yep. thought that was reasonable. And we have had numerous times over the last year and a half here. We have had that, but uh, now thanks to John and some other people as well. Uh, we're able to have uh, really good uh, cannabis at yeah. a dollar a gram here. Uh, we limit it to 10 grams per person per day on yeah. that. Because, and uh, even some know. chocolates at pretty cheap prices too, eh? We, we have good prices on yeah. everything. That's yeah. the point here. Yeah, and, that's uh, the whole thing. And that's the point we're trying to make to the government is that it doesn't need to be this expensive. You know they put a dollar a gram tax right off the top yeah. on all the cannabis. And apparently California's market is going crashing because of these taxes. They're the people in California are saying that they taxes the government taxes are ruining the market. The people are going back to uh, selling in their homes and stuff. And, yep. and did you see that thing that I sent you about Ontario saying yep. that they've made more money 
legally in the cannabis shops than selling at someone's home. Well, they have no way of knowing that. No, I like, know. They're so, they, they want to say that. They yeah. want to convince people, hey, come on over to our side yeah, over here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, we're selling more than and those guys. It must be One good, day right? I would like to be able to do that, you know, but not until the government allows for low barrier access, yeah. allows for people that, that, are, that are struggling, that are poor, that are sick, that are daily users, that need cannabis, to get it reasonably. There's no reason they can't. It can be produced outdoor or in hybrid greenhouses very economically, and the government needs to allow that. They need to take their tax off of it. Mm -hmm. It needs to stop being taxed at all other points as well. There's probably three or four or five different points of taxation before it actually gets to the government store. What yeah. the hell are they taxing it for? <laughs> what do they need taxes on weed they're, they're for? They're helping people like you know? you, helping you. Like I see those taxes would go to a, your program to help people get high dose edibles would be great. That would be fine. That would be plus great. That would be fine. Huh? A sales tax. Plus sales tax. And, 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 sales and provincial tax. tax and GST because it's a goods Look, and service. <laughs> a tax happens because, well, the government needs revenue. Yep. But it needs to be justified to some degree. Yeah. So they tax everything with a sales tax because they do have some inspections that they do. They've got, you know, CSA pr approval on a bunch of different things. And, and so there's work that they do and they deserve to have some taxes on that for sure. Other things that get taxed in life need to be things that are costing our society money. Mm -hmm. And the people that are engaged in that, that cost us money, should be giving back. They should be they should covering be, yeah. the costs yeah. of, of what the, the problems with alcohol are, yeah. what the problems of commercial tobacco are. When there are problems in our society with, with people using things, uh, you know, the wear and tear on the roads, there's a whole bunch of examples of how people <coughs> cost us money as a whole, yeah. and, and they should pay up their fair share, a small amount, because everybody put together with a small amount makes the big amount yeah. that you need to cover the costs of things. But with cannabis... You know, it's been lied about for a long time. That's the yeah. number one thing you've got to basically yeah. start with for anybody who doesn't get this. Cannabis was lied about from the very start. And if you're going to tell a, a lie, they learned, tell a really big lie yeah. and you got a chance. Of, uh, yeah. So they told the opposite. In the last they said, decades. They said that this plant has no medical value. <laughs> And they said it drives you insane and violent. Uh -huh. <laughs> Nothing could be any further from the truth than those two statements about this particular yeah, plant. It helps you. This is a, a mimic of your own interior chemistry, your endocannabinoid system. Balancing and system. That, that maintains all the other systems. It's the most medical thing you could possibly have. It is absolutely, of all of the medicinal herbs... And, and all the things that are medicine, all the foods that we eat, everything yeah. that we ingest that we try this to help ourselves with, nothing comes close to, to providing that which we need for all the different things that could go wrong than cannabis. It is the most medical thing, not no medical value, but that's where it sits still at the federal level in the states as something that has no medical value. And even our government in Canada here, Health Canada, says that, ca that they don't agree that cannabis has medical value. <laughs> you know, we've got hundreds, That's because they're run by a bunch of old folks. <laughs> oh, millions of medical users. Yeah, millions. Hundreds of thousands of people with their doctor's approval and to use it. And zero deaths. Zero deaths. Zero is, deaths. You can't say that about ice cream. No. You can't say that about tomatoes. You can't say that about any other thing that you can put into your mouth. Everything yeah. can kill you if you misuse it or eat too much or don't swallow it right. But cannabis smoke doesn't kill anybody ever. And even edibles don't kill people because they can't. Because it's made of the same stuff that your body is made out of and, and, and manufactures all the time. Yeah. And that's one of the cool things about cannabis. And this is what I mean. They told so many lies. In the original article by Emily Murphy talked about how people using cannabis would be addicted horribly and the only way out was a horrible death. Oh, yes. They a horrible death. They couldn't have told I'm, any I'm bigger lies. <laughs> I'm, I'm living longer. Everybody's living longer. I'm not longer. dying a horrible death Look because I'm smoking Willie cannabis. Willie Nelson and <laughs> Tommy Chong. I mean, he, and he, he defeated cancer and he's now 80 years old and it's all because of he's saturating himself with weed. So, yeah, saturating yourself with weed is not dangerous, harmful, or, or deadly at all. It is quite the opposite. And, and so, yeah, they've lied through their teeth about this stuff. I know, eh? And so, until they stop using the criminal <coughs> law against anything to do with cannabis, there needs to be no penalties to do with cannabis mm. at all, period. I mean, we penalize for what? Mm -hmm. There should be no penalties. But taxes, cannabis offsets the use of some other things that are well known yeah. to cause our society lots of money. Alcohol, pharmaceutical drugs, believe it or not, as beneficial as they are for many people, and, and they have their place, and they do wonderful things for lots of people, 
they are also <coughs> are responsible for a whole lot of deaths. Uh, pharmaceutical drugs in many cases are misused. Uh, they're not taken as directed. There's all kinds of issues with that. And they kill people. They kill a lot of people. And nobody even knows how many people die from reactions to pharmaceuticals because the doctors aren't under any obligation. Funny how they made that little loophole in there. But they're not under any obligation to report adverse deaths from pharmaceuticals. Yeah. And so, you know, it offsets the use of all of these things that are, are, are cigarettes. I mean, you know... 4.5 to 6 million people every 12 months around the planet dying specifically from the consumption of commercial tobacco. So cannabis offsetting the use of all these things that is costing our society a whole bunch of money means that the government shouldn't be taxing it. If anything, they should be giving you a subsidy to get it. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it should be encouraged and, and supported. I'm, I'm saving my government money by smoking cannabis because it keeps me healthy and I'm me not too. in the doctor's office. Me right? too. Exactly, right? Yeah. So, and it, I haven't know. taken pharmaceutical drugs other than the Excedrin I don't, I don't that I do a take for my, my migraines. I hardly ever sometimes. get the flu. I don't take flu shots. Taking I don't, cannabis, right? It don't cost them nothing. No. And, and I'm just about 65 years old now. Yep. I'm in pretty damn good health. Yep. And when I first started smoking cannabis... The whole thing was, is then, man, man, you're going to kill yourself with that stuff. You know, you <laughs> We're proving that? them wrong, aren't we? We sure are. We sure are. I remember Greg Williams. I love you, buddy. I hope you're yep. having a great time up there with all those other fallen heroes of ours. Um, I miss you so much. Uh, I remember Greg Williams when we had our uh, Global Marijuana March, and we were outside the uh, American consulate. Yeah. And he stood up there, and he said, I was told that this stuff is harmful, and yep. it's going to hurt me, and I should mm. not be smoking this, and, and it's going to cause lung cancer and all these things. He said, I, I don't know if anybody smoked as much as I have. <laughs> he talked about all of his trips, you know, that he'd taken around the world to, yeah. to, to sample uh, hero doses of, wow. of, you know, all these different great cannabinoids because that's just what he did. And he smoked his whole life constantly. Yeah. And, and he said, here I am. I'm standing here. You know, I, I'm old now. You know, look at me. You yeah. know, wh wh where's all the harm? Yeah. And I'm living proof that there's no reason. And, and his point was... There's no point to... They're using the criminal law. Mm -hmm. Does anybody understand how ludicrous that is? The mm -hmm. criminal law. You have possession of some flowers, you know, just some dried flowers, and they're going to call you a criminal. <laughs> they're going to come after you with guns and handcuffs. They could be putting you in a cage. They're going to bring you through the courts and treat you like a criminal. You know what it means to be a criminal? A criminal is somebody, once proven who purposely, intentionally did significant harm to some innocent person. You know, that's what a criminal is. They're nasty people. Well, at least they used to be. That's what they're supposed to be. It's not supposed to be something that you would call somebody without really, really saying, this is a bad person here. This is somebody who knowingly and intentionally has been proven to cause harm to other people. Yeah. You know, that didn't just call the police if somebody stole them. They went and beat the person to, pul to a pulp oh, or whatever. Yeah. Whatever it is, you know, whatever it is. That's what a criminal is supposed to be. But in, and that's what they taught me in school. Yeah. Uh, I took law in school. And a criminal, you know, you had to have the actus rea, the mens rea, to understand that you were going to do damage and then you still do it and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, we're smoking cannabis. And I'm in that category. Oh, I know. Eh? <laughs> and you know what that's... that does? When, when you put... Uh, a young person, a 15-year-old person, into a category of a uh, criminal. You're just making them a, a junior criminal. You make them a criminal. Yep. You yep. do. Yep. And so they, they and don't, get sent to a, they don't a, think criminal is bad. A school, like a, what do they used to call it? Well, them? if they juvenile put you in jail. School, juvenile yeah. schools, yeah. They yeah, used to have juvenile. school for criminals. Yeah, yeah. But you start hanging with criminals. You start considering other criminal things. A drug is just a drug is just a drug at that point. Yeah. You don't, you're not told that. Well, this drug cannabis is not like these other drugs. These other drugs can kill you. Mm -hmm. uh, these other drugs can addict you. These other drugs can ruin your bowels. They can ruin your digestive system. They can ruin your brain. They can, they you know, you misuse these things for a long time. You use opioids for a long time. It rewires how yep. your brain works. It rewires how you think about and things. And what we learned from that show, it takes two years off of opioids for that frontal lobe to heal itself. I remember from dope sick, that was just it's a, a long time. It's yeah, a, two years. These are dangerous substances. And so now, because you've decided, you you know, most young people aren't really stupid. I mean, they're not experienced, but you know, they're they're careful about some things. I was when yeah. I when I first smoked my first joint. I was careful about it. I had, I'd looked at my friends that had been smoking for a while. I thought about it. I you know. I I, re, I knew before I puffed yeah, on it that too. this wasn't something that was going to really hurt me that yeah. night, and uh, you know, and it was okay. But you know, 
I got educated through the criminal system because when I was getting weekends, well, the thing was to go to the Addiction Research Foundation to learn about what I was doing. <laughs> so the, the, the criminal justice system paid for my education and told me that pot's not really going to hurt me. So I started smoking it anyways, right? right. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I do have a report from the London guys. Right. Do you want me to read that? Sure. All right. So they, they another marvelous Tuesday, Green Angels Therapix Cannabis Substitution Program. They had 150 to 180 people today nice. lined up. High noon, all left hip happy. We have some uh, coats, gloves, hats, and other clothing that we gave away. Wonderful. Uh, thank you to I and D for the donated cloths and, and to all that have donated. Thank you. And to ARC for donating cake mix and other things. All right. So, yeah, and the Canadian Lumber Company. Yeah, and Canadian Lumber Company. The Canadian Lumber yeah, Company. Yeah, thank you very much. The Canadian oh, yeah. Lumber Company sent us a wonderful donation of papers that has helped our, our program out a lot. And uh, when, we, when we were getting right low on them, I contacted them to see if they would do it again. Yeah. And they did. Uh, they sent it all the way here. Yeah. UPS. I don't know. Are those people on drugs? <laughs> Why? I, well, the address I gave was was the post office right here at uh, Main and Hastings. Yeah, I have a post office box there. Oh, okay. So you don't get mail actually here. I could. Oh, I, but I, I thought that I was probably the, the safer bet. You know, oh, yeah. that it can can arrive at the post office and then I'll go there and in my box will be a card and then they'll give me the box. It's not coming and it's not coming. I'm checking the tracking number. I go to the UPS store. Yeah. Up on Main Street there. Yeah. Uh, they check on it for me. Um, uh, it, it's coming. It's it's been delayed because we had, <laughs> we had the floods. You know the the roads washed out. Uh, and stuff, yeah, yeah, so it's yeah. coming. Yeah, we've heard uh, that twice before. Twice right? I went there because the next time it said that it was being sent back. So now I go straight back to the UPS store. What the heck is going on here? And they say, well, it still says it's just uh, delayed and pending. But nope, they sent it back. I don't know why they sent it back. They say they sent it back because they can't deliver to the post office. Oh, how stupid is that? But Canadian Lumber tells me that lots of times they do deliver to yeah. the post office. So yeah. sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, apparently. They had my phone number. I went there twice. You know, <laughs> they didn't call they you They sent the thing all the way back to Halifax, oh, and now they got to send it all the way back here. Wow. So I hope that UPS is paying for that. Yes. And uh, they're certainly paying for it with a little bit of bad publicity. Uh, be careful with those people. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you want to use Express Post. Uh, I, I Canada use Post. later. <laughs> UPS, what are you doing? What are you doing? We could have uh, had those papers by now. Anyway, oh, wow. so that happened. Um, yeah, William and, and crew there in London. Thank man, you. I'm so, you know, it warms my heart so much what you guys are doing there. Uh, Chris Backer in Halifax and his team there with the Cannabis Substitution Program East Coast. They've just passed their two year anniversary. Wow. I know what that feels like. We're coming up to five. Wow. Uh, but two years is a long, long time. time. Yeah. Um, I got this card. Uh, this is from uh, one of our members here of the CSP. And, and what she says is, thank you for always being there. Ah, oh, that's really That's her nice. message. And, you know, that made me think about, you know, the people that I work with here, that I've been blessed with a really good crew of people. Uh, for the last five years, the, the same people that have, that started helping me, mm -hmm. you know, in the early days at Van Du are still the people that are here working still every today. day, six days a week. Now we have Jen and George and Andrew, and uh, and so they've they've allowed us to never miss. <laughs> we never missed. We went for the first year at Van Du every Saturday. Yeah. We went for the next two and a half years at Van Du every Thursday and every Sunday. We never missed because of good, reliable people that cared yep. uh, and made it happen. There was a few times when I was too sick to be there. I, I would come and just drop off stuff, and I, I couldn't have been there to do it. But there was always that team of people that was there making it happen. Mm -hmm. And so that is one of the things that, uh, that also warms my heart, brings a tear to my eye, is, is how reliable we have been for almost yeah. five years now. Uh, it's been over a year and a half since we moved into the store. And once we had the storefront, we went six hours or six days a week, eight hours a day. Uh, we did have to go through the struggles of being evicted from the store, but we got an RV and we parked it out front, and we never missed. We've been, we don't we're not open on Mondays. Mondays, it's important that we have a day off, although it's really we should be seven days a week here because the opioid crisis doesn't take a day off. Mm. But we've never missed. Uh, we'll be here Christmas Eve and 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 Christmas Day and New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. And uh, you know we we will never we'll never miss you. So Charlie you know. says that she would have, she would have never known about a year if it wasn't for Glenn Wells. 
Yeah, uh, you've done great work, man. Great job, team. Yes, thank absolutely you. part and, of it. And team. I thank you for allowing me to be here. Right. Well, I wouldn't have this. We'd be able to help people out unless I was part of your program. And even if you weren't coming show. on the show, yeah, I know you. Yeah. you would be helping with the CSP in some way, shape, or form. If I could, yeah, and and you'd be talking about us on the the broadcast yeah. that you do. Yeah, and that's all part of getting the word out to, of what we're doing. One of the other areas of struggle here for us is to get media attention, and mm-hmm. it, it boggled my mind for quite a while. Because I knew what we were doing was profoundly good. Yeah, you know, we, we're here every day. We, we get to see the people. We get to understand the effects the of what we're doing. Hear it's the a, stories. It's the stories that are really affect you. You know, and, really. and this is a, a controlled substance that they use the criminal law against. Yeah. And here it is, the thing that's going to work for saving people's lives. Yeah. And nobody's being harmed in any way by it, other than then sometimes they go through an uncomfortable night when they eat too much, and they usually don't do that more than once or twice. It's a self-regulating experience. But, uh, you know, this is big news. This is huge news. Uh, Here our governments have been spending billions of dollars for decades criminalizing this plant, which, as it turns out, was not what they said it was at all. It was the complete opposite. It's it's your endocannabinoid system on the outside Uh. as a supplement. It's so great, and it's one of the answers to the opioid crisis. And the big story is, is that why can't we get governments to... Help us. Help us. I know. It's, it's, it's insane. Crazy. It is. It's, it's the biggest insane. So I thought, it well, is. that's a big story. That The media will be all over this when they get when they understand that that's what's that's going me. on here. Yeah. We're operating out of an RV because we can't get back into our storefront because Health Canada has taken 15 months and they still haven't approved our application for licenses and it's all because of corruption. Well, the media is going to be all over that. Yeah. But they're not. I, I want to get maybe John DeMurray to write a letter to that guy at Global because they've got a new guy that goes out and shows what BC people are doing good for the community. I, I Let's think keep pushing. Let's like keep that. pushing. Yeah. I mean, I recently wrote gonna, a letter to I'm Jazz Joe Hall. So take this hat because this one is like kind of wet. It's uh, dripping in the back of my neck here. So I'm, if you don't mind, I'm going to go with it. just broke the illusion. Oh, wow. Well, that's right. Oh, the illusion man. is here. Ah, that's You only so had a couple better. more moments to go. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but you can feel that. Look, <laughs> uh, it was raining out water, man. <laughs> I'm sorry, kids. You'll have to ask your parents to explain that to you. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure they have a proper explanation as to why Santa just all of a sudden uh, took, took his off beard. his beard. On. <laughs> I don't oh. think we're kids uh, level. I think we're 18 plus on here, YouTube, right? Are we? Yeah. I that think doesn't mean kids don't watch. I'll bet you there's parents out there that are allowing their kids to see what we're well, having mean, to yeah, say. Yeah, here. maybe the kids watching over the shoulder or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, well, yeah, well, yeah. You don't want them sitting right in front of me on the Chesterfield because maybe they, maybe they can see you through your TV screen and come send in the, uh, the minor police or something. No, the point is, is that this is a huge story and the media is not covering it. Why? And, and that's the other side of what we're doing here is that we are exposing through what we're trying to do and all of our efforts to get legitimacy the corruption that, that's operating here in Canada mm-hmm. and, and around the world. This is a worldwide phenomena of corruption that's going on. And, uh, and they do not want people to be using cannabis as opposed to the other things that they control. And if they're going to use cannabis, they want you paying a huge fine up front. They want to make mm-hmm. billions of dollars off you. They don't want to lower the price. And they don't want people to have low barrier access because that's got to be what's happening. Yeah. Low barrier access is a simple phrase for sick people getting medicine easily. That's all that means. A sick person, probably a poor person, maybe somebody who has lost their ID, maybe a homeless person, maybe somebody who doesn't have access to a bank account or a telephone. Many of these people exist in our society. Low barrier access means they can easily get the medicine that they need in the form of cannabis. That's what needs to happen. It's easy. And improve their lives. Improve their lives. It'll save their life. It'll improve their life. We know that. We know that. We've proven that. Dr. MJ Malloy has put out dozens and dozens and dozens, and I mean that literally. Go and check and see. Google him, please. That show that this is true. Yep. That this is true. Cannabis helps people like that. And we know it's true in the cannabis community. And if you don't know that's true, well, it doesn't take too much looking into it. Just ask some people who use cannabis. Go online. If you stay away from the, the anti-cannabis websites, there's not too many, but I've seen a couple. They're really hilarious, actually, with what they say. Oh, my God. Before and after <laughs> pictures, it would blow your mind. Because we have before and after pictures of our, our clientele here over the last five years, it would blow your mind. Because we've given people their lives back, and that's what it does. So the fact that we can't get media coverage speaks to just how corrupt this whole yeah. situation is. Those people that control the media don't want to cover what we're doing. No. Those people that are going to make huge dollars off of cannabis of being prohibited and are making huge dollars off of it being legal, they don't want us doing what we're doing. They obviously have our government by the short and curlies because it would take just a week 
for, for a grade 12 education to look at our application, which John Conroy did such a fabulous job of putting together to show just clearly and precisely that what we're doing works, why it works, how it works. All those studies are included in that. Testimonials from the people that we were dealing with. All of that. It's really simple, easy. It's clear. It's there. We made it as easy as we could. And it's been 15 months. And, and a government that is there to help people would have very, very quickly given us a license. And the licenses might have taken a bit of time because they've, they've woven, woven themselves quite a nasty little web of corruption with respect to what legalization means and how you get to buy cannabis from government licensed stores. So, yeah, licenses to work around that system that they have will take a little bit of time. Not too much, but a little bit of time. But what shouldn't have taken any time is simply an exemption, just an exemption, if not from Health Canada, from the, the health minister's office, a ministerial exemption. That's what we applied for as well. We applied for that under an emergency basis over 15 months ago. And here we are, still operating out of an RV, hoping we can get back into the store, wishing that we could better meet the needs of the neighborhood that we're involved with here. Uh, it is extremely disgusting. It is all about corruption. So that's why people, please help us get the word out. It's important that people understand that cannabis high-dose edibles is a way off of opioids. People that are struggling with addiction to opioids are in all different walks of life, to all different financial demographics, because lots of people from all around, in every walk of life, get hurt sometimes and get put onto opioids by doctors and lots of times end up not being able to kick that habit and end up in trouble. So we never know who it is. You don't know who it is. There's lots of people that they don't tell nobody that they're, they're struggling with addiction. They yeah. don't tell nobody that they've got a hookup and they're putting needles in their arms or they're crushing and snorting or whatever it is that they're doing. They don't tell nobody. They're ashamed of it. They're embarrassed by it. Yeah. We need to get the word out that, that those people can get relief through high-dose edibles. They can get through the withdrawal to stop doing that. And the high-dose edibles or concentrates at that point or sometimes even just smoked flour at that point will be enough to deal with whatever issues, yeah. pain issues, emotional issues, anxiety, depression, whatever it is, cannabis can help people. The right dose, the right, the right strain, uh, the right form of ingestion, most people could find relief through cannabis. And people that are trying to get relief through harmful and dangerous other substances need to know. Mm -hmm. So please, please help us get the word out. Bug your local media, bug the big stream media. I'm in favor of, of, of messaging global, sure, of course, why not? Somebody I says send... CBS News too. There's a Steve Hartman from CBS News. Have you talked to him? Try I don't know about Steve, but I do have a guy at CBS News. Or oh no, 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 no. no. CBC. CBC. I have a CBC, CBC guy. American. He gets all of my emails. I just recently sent one to the new uh, Federal Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. I, I sent one to uh, all of the people that I send them to. I always copy the, the CBC reporter because he was interested couple of years ago, yeah. you know, what we're, how things were going here. So I've kept him up to date, but they've never done a story. Uh, CBC in London, Ontario did a story on, well, sort of on what Mary was doing because what Mary was doing and, and William and all the rest of the people are now taking it over. Uh, they got a story done there, but it, they didn't. Uh, no, write hardly no. anything of what people said that yeah. were interviewed who said some very, they, you know, profound things. They wrote things. their own view. Well, they went to some doctor of dentistry, a professor, a dentistry <laughs> professor, to ask him about uh, cannabis uh, as a replacement for opioids, and he said he had never heard of that, and he didn't think that there was any evidence that it did any good. Well, he's certainly been living under a rock Not for the yet. last quite a while. Well, he, he hasn't looked he's into been it. Living in Ontario. <laughs> is, that, is that what it is? I don't. I don't want to slag the Ontario Sorry. people, but you can. I, I, yeah, I, I was born there. You know, you're born there. Born there. Yeah. <laughs> we have to be careful here on the on the west uh, coast about slagging Ontario because they're the center of the universe and they could wipe us out in a, in a you know. A Charlie is asking where she can send donations. Can she send it right here to 157 East Cordova? Well, sure. Yeah, yeah. that can happen. Yeah, uh, I think they're edibles. Edible donation, uh, if she's anywhere close. Yeah, she's in BC here. Uh, but it, well, BC doesn't necessarily mean close. No, I know. But anywhere in the lower mainland, I would go and pick them up. Oh, yeah. No, I'll make I, that easy. I don't think it's. Uh, otherwise, it can come to my post office box. Yeah. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll post that at yeah. some point. Yeah, and uh, Neil told, him, told her to get a hold of you also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she was she, she made a couple of donations to the tubes and dubs. So right. she was going to send us edibles, but because of the snow, she couldn't get here or couldn't get the stuff out to us. So. I see. So she's a little farther away than <laughs> yeah. Vancouver. Yeah, I so think maybe the wonderful. island or something. Oh, she's uh, 
Uh, so she'll probably answer where she is. <laughs> so probably we should go to the... Uh, <coughs> go outside, see how it's yeah. going, see how Casey's it's doing. It's exciting day. She's got is the Casey table. out there? Yeah, oh, she's good. at the table, yeah. All right, let's go. Well, we'll go out for a little drizzly, I think. It is very drizzly. At least it's not freezing rain yet. Well, that's only for Mission. <laughs> I do the report. Did you? Yeah, <laughs> but I think they got one for Vancouver, too. Vancouver a version of freezing rain is freezing with rain. It's not actually freezing <laughs> rain. Uh, to keep up. So yeah, here we are in uh, lovely downtown Vancouver. It's a very dark, drizzly night here. It's quite cold as well. And uh, this is the Healing Wave RV, the uh, Ganja Mobile, the Scooby Dooby van. Uh, our base of operations, our home for the last uh, well over 13 months now that we've been operating out of this place. Um, so, dudes and dudes, we need light. We need light out here, here yeah. Let, let so people see where we are. Can I have that light, please, George? Oh, that's, that's the one I want. I have to find a replacement. I'm sure you can handle it. Nice. <laughs> well, that's a start. Yeah. Start. Here. There we go. There we go. Thank you. That's a little better. There we go. So yeah, so how many we well, we've given out one box already. <coughs> got nice. So hi Daisy. Hey, how's it going? It's going good. We, we have a so we have a bunch of people with us here. Yeah. Where they're uh, the Casey here. here. What we're it's doing. like we've given about fifty people. No, I mean socks. the people I mean the people at home. Oh people at home. I'm yeah. telling Casey that we have a bunch of people with yeah. us here ah. that are checking out what we're doing. So we got John Murray's muffins. Yep, right here. These are 100 milligrams each. With a little bit of Christmas decoration on them. That's we got a bag time. of doobies. A bag of doobies. Got the tubes and doobies, right? We got the tubes. The tubes there. And we got we the got hot the chocolate. Uh, yeah, hot chocolate. And apparently the uh, cocoa coffee has gone cold. Okay, so we'll have to heat that up. Yeah, we'll have to heat that up. We gave out a bunch of it. But, uh, thank you very much, come. Coca Cafe. Yeah. And well, thank you stuff. very much, Jim Hortons. Yeah, and, definitely. Yeah, and come and, on. Uh, also, Cindy, uh, is, purses. are the purses still here? Yeah, they're so, here. Do you know about the purses, uh, Casey? You did, I did tell her. So one per person, one, one per lady, that uh, comes and wants Wait, one. Wait, one lady said no. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, Socks and hot chocolate? No, that's fine. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so that's why we yell out and everybody walks by. So have a free pair of warm pair of socks. All right. And so that's tubes and dubs. Yeah. There's Jennifer Nelson supervising as always over there. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm pretty good. In uh, show number like 217 or something like that. 118. You know? 118. That's right. Two years, but only 118. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself here. <laughs> so, how was the day? It's been good. Yeah? A little yeah. wet? Yeah. Yeah. Drippy, drippy. But, uh, <laughs> That's well, Vancouver for you. No problems? <laughs> everything's good? Yeah. Very good. We're going to go check out the back door and see what's okay. going on there. Would you like a nice warm pair of socks? A hot yes, chocolate? Please. You want? Here you go. Here you go. I added our sign today. That's the secret knot. People do the knot, but they don't finish. <laughs> I see. Out here today. How are you doing, Santa? It's going great. Yeah? Another, yeah. another average day uh, helping save the world. Yeah, another Tuesday here about 25 to 30 people come, members come down here and get their 420. Right, what do you got for them today? Well, things are kind of slim today, but we're working it. I got some uh, caramels here, 150 milligram caramels from Robert. Right. I got some brownies from Roberta. Beautiful. Those are 80 milligram brownies. She comes nice. every week. She's a good supplier. I got some uh, uh, Gorilla Ganjas, nice. but, we're down, but everybody loves uh, yeah, Indica, right. so we're down to the uh, CBD and the mango. Okay, so we'll put another order into the Gorilla Ganja people. And we just got these ones. These ones are 30 milligram watermelon gummies. Some BC Bud Guys. Yes. And, and you still got some there from s and Sweet Shops? I have some chocolates, yes, some 50 milligram chocolates. Doug and Michelle, right. an awesome donation. And same with the uh, lollipops. Beautiful. 50 milligram lollipops. Right. I have some snake oil here that's very popular. Yeah. This snake oil, I looked it up, is 800 milligrams. Right. There's 400 milligrams of CBD and 400 milligrams of honey oil. Right. I looked that up. Now I have uh, 
Damien's cookies. I have nice. 100 milligram Damien cookies. Right on. For people to choose from today. So, and I also cool. have. Uh, pills. Right on. That's from Dirty Dave. Yes, those are great. Those those, are, are those the 50 milligrams or the five? These are the 50s. 50s, right? Yeah, I can tell the difference in the color. I, I know which jar is in. Right on. These are the five in the blue jar. Right on. Little light. Now we had somebody here, some lady that's been taking the 50 milligram pills, and yeah. she can give a testimony if she wants because it, it's changed her life. Yeah. Her and her uh, fiance it changed her life. Right. She's I have some 50 milligram uh, key fills that uh, George has been making. Right. Right here. These are very popular. People like them, right? Nice. Nighttime because it helps you sleep, right? Yep. And that's all we have today. Uh, topical? Topical. Do you have a topical? Not out here right now. Not out? Okay. Well, we'll get some out more out here. Yeah, we'll have to. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I've had. Oh, very good, Andrew. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll see you around the other side. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Merry Appreciate Christmas. It. Merry Christmas, guys. Yes. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. Charlie's is for now. Oh. For now, so that's why she didn't get here. I see. She said there's two pills in the snow. I can right now. And it's still the blowing. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the other cannabis substitution programs uh, in London and Halifax, uh, Jason Lafassi in uh, Sudbury, there's a Sudbury cannabis substitution program page. Uh, you can check that out on Facebook, check ours out on Facebook as well, the cannabis, uh, Vancouver Cannabis Substitution Program. We have two of them now, uh, because the CSP uh, Project and the, uh, cannabis and the Vancouver Cannabis Substitution Program, because, uh, you know, Facebook for a while disabled our page. Uh, but thankfully we got it back. It took months and months. I'm not sure what happened. You know, they didn't tell us anything about how that all worked out. But uh, we did get that page back, so now we have two of them. Check all that out. Uh, do what you can. Uh, thanks for all those people that are doing stuff to try to make the world a better place. Uh, try to do that, to, not just at Christmas time, but this is a great time to be doing that as well. Uh, you know, if somebody's struggling, this is a great time to uh, get that that joy of giving and, and helping somebody out a little bit. Uh, why not? It's, it's cold outside and, and everybody maybe could use a little bit of help. And you never know how far that good deed could go. You never really know if you give somebody a little bit of a help up, uh, you know, how far they get up and, and what they do with that. And it, it can really make the world a much better place if, uh, if you do just that one simple gesture. So uh, kind of do that every day and uh, every chance you get. And uh, if we all do that, then the world will be a much better place. Uh, you can find out more about all these different issues at POT TV. There's all kinds of uh, stuff in the archives that you can stream and have a look at. And uh, thanks again to everybody. I hope you all have a really Merry Christmas. And uh, while you're uh, you know, having your Christmas dinner and meeting with your families, uh, keep it in mind that the most important thing always is to have as much fun as you can. See you next week. <laughs> you hear that?